The Pfeiffer family purchased this house in 1913. It was built by a, a local uh, master builder here in Piggott named Buck Templeton. And Mr. Templeton built it to be his family home. But the Pfeiffers, when they moved here, were able to, to convince him to sell it. When Paul Pfeiffer decided to move his family here from St. Louis, this was the closest to being out in, no, in the middle of nowhere for, for Paul, and he liked being in the middle of nowhere. And it was a big enough house for his family that he talked uh, Mr. Templeton into selling him the house. So it's 1910 it was built, and then the Pfeiffers moved in on July 4th, 1913. As you go through the house, uh, you see many features that come from it being the house of a, of a local builder. For instance, every room has uh, a different pattern tin ceiling. So it has a lot of commercial builder touches to it, like all of the doors have glass in them, which is kind of unusual. You see that in drug stores and that sort of thing. And we believe the reason for that is that, uh, is that Mr. Templeton was using scraps from his other projects and, and making, them, making them work here. I think it's important for people to know that when we did this restoration, we didn't just pick these colors. These are the original colors. We decided when we first started the restoration that we wanted to be as authentic as possible. So we decided that we had to have three proofs of practically anything we did. So when we started looking at what color are the walls, one proof was we could visibly observe what had been left behind, like for instance, the radiators were taken out and behind the radiators, you could see the original paint. Then we also had paint from every room shipped to a, uh, an analysis and they did a very scientific analysis of every layer of paint to get down to what the original layers were. And then we did oral history interviews with some of the people that were still living that were here when Hemingway was here and what they remembered the colors being. And so all of those went together to inform what colors we painted. <laughs> As you come in on the ground floor from the front porch, uh, there's a, a parlor and a living room that kind of flows together. Off of that space, there's the office we're in now. And then next, next door is the family chapel. Mary was a devout Catholic. They lived in St. Louis before they moved here, and I don't think Mary was real thrilled about moving from St. Louis, where she had all kinds of things she could do, to move into a remote place in Piggott, you know, on the edge of town. And so uh, Paul promised her that if they moved to Piggott, he would put in a chapel for her and have the chapel consecrated and have the priest come up here uh, periodically to say mass with her. The priest would come from Perigold once a month or so. And, and would say mass here. Paul said that she could buy all new furniture, so most of the furniture is signed stickly pieces, which uh, were unusual for the time for somebody to own the original stickly pieces. And she put in uh, new floors and she put in a chimney with a fireplace for the living room. So a lot of those are all touches that, that Mary herself put in. And also on this floor is the dining room and kitchen, and then a summer kitchen off of the, the main kitchen. Uh, and then upstairs, we have, uh, we have five bedrooms. Pauline's room upstairs is kind of unusual. I call it Pepto-Bismol pink. <laughs> and so it's where she and Ernest stayed when they would visit here. And so I like to tell people that I think they would be shocked to know that Ernest slept in a Pepto-Bismol pink <laughs> bedroom. One of the things that the Pfeiffers were known for is that during the, uh, during the Great Depression, they made opportunities for, for work for, for people in the community. So the outside of the house, from that 10 year period, we found 40 coats of paint, discovered that what was happening was Mr. Pfeiffer was, when people would need work, he would, he would create work for them, even if it didn't, you know, even if it was painting a house that had just been painted. Another version of that was that the, the Pfeiffers would buy quilts from local families. Or that, that storage closet upstairs we, we used to tell, to tell that story. Behind the house, the, the, the family's barn was converted to a studio uh, for Ernest, and then that has also been restored and is part of the, the museum experience now. When Ernest and Pauline first came here in 1928, he was well into the first draft of A Farewell to Arms. 
So he finished most of that draft while he was here, while they were waiting on the birth of their son. Uh, and they went to Kansas City for the birth. Then they came back here to Piggott and Ernest went on to Wyoming and finished the story there, then came back and put the finishing touches on it. But the interesting thing was it was really also informed by what was going on in his life because Pauline and Ernest had gone to Kansas City to have the baby. Pauline had a very rough time. They wound up taking him by cesarean. Uh, the doctor said she shouldn't get pregnant again because she'd had such a rough time. And so Ernest started thinking about, oh my gosh, what would have happened if she would have died? And so as he thought about this, he worked it into the ending of A Farewell to Arms because in A Farewell to Arms, the hero falls in love with a nurse that takes care of him uh, when he's wounded in World War I. And she, she winds up pregnant and when he goes in to check on her, she seems to be doing okay, so he goes out to get something to eat and when he comes back in, he finds that she's died during childbirth. So it's it's what Ernest did a lot, you know, taking real situations and twisting them and saying, okay, how would it have turned out if this had happened or that had happened? Pauline and Ernest started visiting here in, in 1928 to 1936. They, they kind of fell into the pattern that what they would do is you know, they were living in Key West at the time and they would spend the winter uh, in Key West and then when it be became hot, they would travel and usually they would end up here in the fall for the hunting season. Uh, Ernest was a, an avid hunter and enjoyed quail hunting um, in Arkansas. Well, of course, when they got divorced, uh, his son John, who was known as Bumby, uh, stayed in Paris, in France, with his mother. But during the summers and holidays and so forth, he would come here to the United States and it would go wherever Pauline and Ernest were going. And of course, a lot of times he came with them to Piggott. And one time when they were here in Piggott in, in 1932, which was a very bad ice storm and everybody was sick, uh, Bumby got sick and they called a doctor here and the doctor told Mary and Pauline that he had a 102 degree temperature. So, they gave him some medication and Ernest then left and went out quail hunting. Spent the whole day quail hunting and he came back in and went to his son's room to check on him and his son was very quiet and eventually asked his dad, uh, Dad, when am I gonna die? And Ernest said, I'm saying Ernest because this was a true story that he then wrote a short story about, but Ernest said, well, son, you're not gonna die. What makes you think that? And his son said, oh yeah, Dad, I know I'm going to die because I heard that if you have a temperature over 44 degrees, you will die. And of course, he was confusing Celsius temperature used in France to Fahrenheit. And so, you know, then Ernest realized that here his poor son had been waiting all day to die while he was out quail hunting. So he called it a day's wait. It's a very short story. But, you know, another example of uh, the way that being here kind of influenced Ernest Hemingway, not, not just in the support he got from the family and the editing support and the financial support from the family, but also it gave him a lot of story ideas. This is a great place to come because I think it introduces people to Ernest Hemingway if they're not, if they haven't really gotten into his writing. But I also think this is a way to let people know just what an impact Arkansas and the Pfeiffer family had on Ernest and his writing. A lot of people think that he didn't like Piggott based on some of his letters when he complained about it being hot or, you know, complaining about various things. But a lot of people have never read the Esquire article that he wrote when he was back in Paris before he went on safari in which he said, I loved Paris once, but for now, I would rather, among other things, be in Piggott on a fall afternoon, which hardly says to me that he <laughs> hated Piggott. Uh, so I think, you know, people get a real sense of the impact this place had on, on Ernest and on his writing.